Welcome to the Just Ingredients Podcast. I'm Cara Lynn, and here we talk all things nourishing to the mind, body, and soul. This is a place where you can find just good ingredients to life. Simply Organic Bamboo is a small family business that specializes in premium bedding, including luxuriously soft sheets, plush comforters, snugly throw blankets, baby crib sheets, and more. Simply Organic Bamboo bedding is temperature regulating, moisture wicking, and breathable, keeping you warm in the winter and cool in the summer. Their bedding is also hyperallergenic and dermatologist recommended, making it a great choice for those with allergies or sensitive skin. Their bedding is sourced from organically grown bamboo that doesn't require the use of pesticides. Most importantly, all of their products are independently certified free of harmful chemicals to ensure the healthiest and most comfortable sleep of your life. Transform your bedroom into a cozy retreat with Simply Organic Bamboo. Use promo code JI25 for an exclusive 25% off site-wide discount at www.simplyorganicbamboo.com. Dr. Mallory Craycroft is an OBGYN who has been helping women for the past 13 years. In 2021, she founded Uplift for Her, a comprehensive health and wellness company dedicated to understanding women and striving to help them feel their best in every way, emotionally, mentally, and physically. Dr. Craycroft currently lives in Salt Lake City, Utah with her husband and two daughters, where she continues to practice today. I am so excited to have Dr. Craycroft back on our show. You guys loved her the first time. She is an OBGYN who was telling us all about hormones and women's health. And so I have brought her back because I want to ask her about birth control, about early pregnancy, things like that. So welcome to the show, Dr. Craycroft. Thank you so much. So happy to be here. Well, thank you for being back again. I really appreciate you taking the time to do this. Maybe just remind my listeners quickly what you do, what you practice, and maybe even your new practice that is coming up. Oh, I'd love to. So I'm an OBGYN. Um, I'm I'm an MD and have been practicing for the last about 10 years and am just getting ready to leave my current full-time OBGYN practice to open up a smaller um, GYN-only clinic that will be more integrative based where we can spend more time talking about lifestyle medicine, like female problems with periods and hormones, but also from a lifestyle perspective of how's your sleep, how's your nutrition, how's your body movement, all of those things that impact it all so much, but we don't really have time to dig into in the conventional setting. I love that. I think it's going to just be so well received and you're going to have so many women reaching out to you and I know you'll be able to help so many people. So I'm excited for that new practice of yours. Thank you. Me too. I'm really excited. So I have a lot of followers and listeners who ask me quite often about birth control. And so that's the main reason I brought you back. I want to talk to an OBGYN about birth control. So let's just start at the very basics, the very beginning of birth control. Can you just explain to me the different types of birth control that are out there? Absolutely. And I will say too, my perspective in counseling about birth control is, and I think this is really key when a patient talks to their provider or talks to anyone about birth control, is it is a very unique decision for each individual woman. And my job is not to tell you what's best for you. It's not to tell you which is the best option. My job is to educate and let you figure out what's best given all the unique circumstances of your life. When I start talking about birth control, I ask women a couple things. Number one is, throw everything out that your friend or your sister or your neighbor said to you about birth control, because it's such a unique thing that applies to you and your body that it really isn't very helpful to to pay too close attention with so-and-so's experience. The second thing I ask women is to think about their priorities. For some women, having a baby is not a good thing at that point. They need to not have a baby. You know, I, I counsel 16 and 17 year old girls who are asking about birth control they need to not have babies if they're not planning on having babies. So that's going to be different than a 28 year old woman who's married and planning on having a baby in a year. She might make different decisions for her birth control. So it's a really vastly different conversation depending on who you're talking to. So when we talk about birth control, there's hormonal birth control and non-hormonal birth control. The hormonal birth control options um, that we talk about would be 
Uh, birth control pill is one that people are most familiar with. There's the depo shot, which is the shot that you get once every three months to prevent pregnancy. There's the birth control patch. There's a birth control ring called the Nuva ring. There are a couple different progesterone containing IUDs, intrauterine devices that go inside the uterus to prevent pregnancy. And I think that's it for the hormonal birth control. Wow. We could talk about all of those. Yeah. So let's actually talk about the pill first so that we don't overwhelm everybody. So are there side effects to taking the pill? Absolutely. (laughs) I think anyone who tells you otherwise is, is not telling you the truth. What I will say is that early in my career, I had a list of side effects and patients would come and I would say, here are the only side effects that birth control causes. And now having done this long enough, if a woman comes and says, I'm having this side effect, could it be my birth control pill? I say, yes, it could be. (laughs) It absolutely could be because it it can interact with people's bodies really differently. Not everyone has negative side effects from birth control pills. Some of the negative side effects that I see most frequently are headaches, mood swings, and uh, sometimes nausea, vomiting, sometimes weight gain. All of these are a little complicated because they've studied this in birth control pills. So like weight gain has been studied in a birth control pill and statistically speaking has not been shown to be associated with, with weight gain in a pill. And that's just not the case. It's not the case for everyone, but I have absolutely seen patients who gain weight on a birth control pill, but not most. So everything that we talk about with side effects is, is a mixed bag. So it's really dependent on the person, these side effects. Yeah. Okay. So I do hear a lot of people talking about weight gain, like you said, so that can be dependent on the person. But a lot of times I hear about people suffering from depression as well from the pill. Can that be a side effect? Yeah. You know, the, the studies on the birth control pills say that it can be associated with mood swings, but there have been a couple studies looking just at antidepressant prescription in women who have started a birth control pill and it's higher. Women who have started birth control pills have a higher chance of being prescribed an antidepressant. So yeah, I think absolutely it can increase the risk of mood swings and potentially increase the risk of depression or needing an antidepressant. Now that's, that's a complex issue, right? Someone may have low level depression and the birth control pill is what tips them over the edge to needing an antidepressant. Uh, I think the important thing when we talk about any side effects is I don't ever want to scare someone away from using something that they feel like is good for them. But I do think it's important to recognize, Hey, these are the things that you want to watch for. If you start a pill and you find that your mood is all over the place, could it be the pill? Yes, it could be. So be aware of that. But many women don't have depression and many women don't have any mood swings. In fact, some women do feel like their moods are a little more stable on the birth control pill. So I just want to make sure my listeners understand none of this is to fear people. I just completely believe that you should educate yourself about any product that you're going to take or use. And so just learning what the side effects could be for certain people, um, I think is beneficial for people to help them make the best decision for themselves. Absolutely. And whenever we talk about side effects, you know, you think about the the drug commercials that show a new medication and then at the end they go in rapid speed, right? Could cause da, 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 right. All these different things. And, and that is true. And so that's why I go back to like, this has to be the right decision for you. And for some people knowing that they are not going to get pregnant when they are not ready to get pregnant. And the side effect is a little bit of nausea for some women. They say like, I will take the nausea. I cannot get pregnant. And for other women, the idea of mood swings is like, I cannot have mood swings. So they may not choose that method. So that's why it's great. We have so many different options. So why does birth control cause so many mood swings for people? Because when I tried the pill, when I was very first married, oh my goodness, my mood swings were terrible to the point that I had to get off. So what is causing that? I don't know that we completely understand. I think the generic answer is hormones. You know, it it does mess with our hormones. It suppresses our natural hormones and instead replaces our body's hormonal system with synthetic hormones. And that's why, you know, it looks like it's fixing our periods. So one of the reasons birth control, this is a small detour. One of the reasons birth control pills are prescribed is for women who have really irregular periods. And often they'll go to the doctor and the doctor will say, here, take this birth control pill. It will fix your periods it doesn't fix anything. It just masks it. It makes it look like your periods are normal. So we are replacing whatever your body is doing with your natural female hormones with synthetic hormones. And so some people's bodies don't mind that and feel fine on it. And other people really don't do well with it. 
It's also not just the one pill. There are multiple different types of progesterone or multiple types of progesterone in birth control pills. And some people react to one progesterone, but they don't react to the other progesterone. Okay. So let's actually take this little tangent that you took because a lot of doctors will prescribe birth control for like acne, terrible cramping, heavy periods, things like that. So they're not healing by using the birth control. It's just masking the symptoms, correct? Yeah. I mean, I think it, it absolutely can help with symptom relief of those things. And so for some women who say like, I can't leave the house for seven days a month, a birth control pill very frequently will help that. It will allow them to leave the house those seven days a month. Is it solving the problem? No, it's not getting to the root cause of what's happening, which can be really complicated, but it does help people improve their quality of life sometimes. Right. I tell people, but maybe you would say differently. I tell people like, if that will help you mask the symptoms or help you deal with life better while you figure out the root causes, then go for it. But I'm always trying to encourage, like, at least find out the root cause, because that's your body screaming to you that something is off. So use the pill or whatever to help you at the same time of finding the root cause. Yeah, I think it's a little different just for me, because I see a wide variety of patients. And I have some patients who are not into looking into the root cause at all. They're not looking for, to decrease toxins in the environment and they're not looking for anything except to be able to leave the house during their period. And so I have to counsel those women differently because they're, they're not at the place where they're going to start looking at supplements or start changing their diet or start cutting out toxins. I think for women who are, which is probably women who are seeking you out, you know, a lot of women who are ready, they are ready to take back control of their health they're ready to understand their health, they're ready to optimize their health, those women, you can really start looking at root causes and making changes. But I I do think it's complicated because I, I have to, one of the most difficult parts of my job is trying to guess that as I'm talking to a woman and say, how far do you want to go? You know, some people I start talking about diet changes and they're like, oh, no, no, no. Can I just have my prescription? And other people, if I suggest a prescription, will say like, what? I do not want a birth control pill. So it's really so individual. And that's why I see my job as educating. I will give you all of the information you need and I won't sugarcoat anything. You know, there are hard things about taking birth control pills and there are hard things about making lifestyle changes and people have to decide where they're at and then make their unique plan for them. So yes, a birth control pill absolutely just masks the symptoms. And for some people, that's where they're at. It changes their life. They're able to move forward and I'm happy for them. For people who say like, I don't want to mask the symptoms and I don't want to expose my body to all of those negative side effects. Then we can dig in and look at other alternatives for improving the root cause of their, their menstrual irregularities or other things. I love that so much because I always tell my people like, look, everybody's at a different point on their health journey and some haven't even started a health journey and that's okay. It's just my job to try to educate as much as I can. So I love that you just don't put everybody in the same box and categorize everybody the same way. So thank you for explaining that. So let me ask you a couple other questions about the pill. Are you having a real period if you are on the pill? No, it is a period withdrawal bleed. I mean, it's a pill withdrawal bleed. So you take the hormones and the progesterone in the birth control pill. When you stop it during that um, placebo week, that sugar pill week, when you stop those pills, the progesterone that you're taking drops, the amount of progesterone that your body sees drops and it induces a bleed. Now that's why we can manufacture periods with hormones, right? We can skip periods by skipping the placebo pills. We can use an IUD or the depo shot, or the next one on, that's the one I left out earlier, the rod that goes in the arm, all of those things, we can manufacture absent periods because we're suppressing all natural cycles and just keeping it so that you never have a withdrawal bleed. So no, it is, it's in no way a period. It's a withdrawal bleed. So are there long-term effects with suppressing your natural cycle like that? I don't know if I would say it that way. When you use progesterone in a hormonal contraceptive, it thins the lining of the uterus. Is there any risk in thinning the lining of the uterus for a prolonged period of time? Not that we know of. So for that part of it to not actually make your uterus bleed, that doesn't have any problems that we know of because it's not, some people picture like some sort of corking mechanism, right? Like 
you put something up there and the blood just doesn't come out. So it's like building up inside. And that's not what happens. The progesterone keeps the lining from ever building up. So it doesn't need to shed. Now on the flip side of that, suppressing your system's hormones, which is what a birth control pill does, right? It can, it suppresses the hormones released from released from your ovaries that could have longer term effects, things that are big deals, like potentially breast cancer. Although the studies it, that really depends who you talk to, the studies of that are kind of mixed, but other things like, um, it can change the way that your body processes hormones in the future. So if you ask conventionally trained gynecologists, most of them will say, Nope, no long-term side effects. It leaves your body and it's done. Your body goes back to normal. I don't completely buy into that completely. I think that there are, there can be lingering side effects. Do I think that there are effects that could last your entire life? Yeah, potentially, but I really don't think that we fully understand that. Okay. That's interesting. So back to the period, if it's not a real period, why even skip the pill that week? Well, you don't have to. One of the reasons why we do is because it seemed natural to people. And for, you know, when the birth control pill evolved, it was not well accepted. And there were religious pressures to say, like, we need to make it look like you're having a period. And so that's why it was completely manufactured. From a traditional setting, one of the reasons we induce a period is for a couple of reasons. One, some patients like to see the bleed. They know they're not pregnant because they bled. Mm. Two, some people feel like it's a cleansing, even though it's not really like, like I said, it's just that that lining isn't building up enough, but some women feel like, oh, finally, my body is shedding the blood, you know? And the third reason, which is the most common thing that I see is if you go too long without having a period, oftentimes that lining will get very thin and then people will start spotting because the lining is so thin. So if you take a birth control pill continuously, some people can go for two months, three months, six months, 12 months without having a bleed. But at some point they'll start having what we call breakthrough bleeding and cycling, having a week without hormones will usually fix that. So mostly it's a nuisance thing. Okay. That's good to know. So something I hear often about taking the pill is that it's depleting some nutrients and minerals in the body. And so to be really careful to like take magnesium if you're on the birth control pill, is that correct? Yeah, the birth control pill can decrease um, levels of vitamin B6 and magnesium and zinc. So that's one of the key things when that honestly is new to me. This is not something that I learned in medical school. This is from my own you know, study and training. So to all of my patients who may hear this, forgive me for not telling you this because (laughs) it's not the way we were trained. Um, But yeah, that is one of the ways that you can say, okay, birth control pills may not be ideal for me, but for X, Y, and Z, they're, they're what's working for me right now. What else can I do to support my body? One of those things is, well, you can take extra B6, magnesium, and zinc to support your body from being depleted. Well, and that's interesting though, because a lot of women... I know are short on magnesium and B6 to begin with. So then the pills just making it so you're lower on those even more so. Yes, exactly. Okay. So another question about birth control that I wish I had asked my OBGYN years ago, but maybe the answer would have been differently. If someone takes birth control and they do become really moody and have those mood swings, is there a way to help balance their real hormones during this time or not necessarily? not very easily. The way that the birth control pill is working is by suppressing our natural hormones. So there's not a lot that you can do to, to build that back up. Some people have tried like Vitex or Chase Berry, Chase Tree Berry, which is an herbal supplement, but they're kind of, I mean, they're opposite mechanisms. So I think that one thing that is true is all of the lifestyle changes that we always talk about, like eating whole foods, decreasing toxins in your environment, making sure you have adequate sleep, having some sort of mindfulness and wellness routine. Absolutely. Those help. And that's what I think is key is that a lot of these things are multifactorial and that pill could be a factor in those mood swings, but sometimes we can overcome them. If you feel like this pill is really what I want to stay on like, well, okay, let's make sure everything else is optimized and let's see how that helps. The other thing that I think can be helped um, if you feel like you want to take a pill for whatever reasons is supporting your liver, your detoxification pathways, right? Our bodies have to metabolize this pill. And if our liver is busy doing a whole bunch of other things, it may not move those hormones through as well as it could. So things like um, if we're drinking alcohol, 
that it takes a toll on our liver if we are being exposed to BPA or other, you know, plastics and, and toxins from plastics or from other environmental toxins, that's taking a toll on our liver. So by supporting our liver, it might help to metabolize that medication as best as we can. So there are things that we can try at least. Okay. That's good to know. This is sort of tangent, but I just recently, a few years ago, learned about the importance of the liver with our hormones. I didn't realize it actually metabolized our liver, yeah. our, um, estrogen. our estrogen. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so if we have excess estrogen, that can be because of a sluggish liver that isn't metabolizing it correctly. Right. Right. And that, that could be why we see a little bit of the difference in how people respond to different birth control pills. That's what I mean. It's so multifactorial that maybe someone else is already metabolizing the hormones very well. So their bodies can handle that. I don't know, but, but we are all very different and we know that that liver has to be supported. Okay. So now let me ask you another question about the pill, because I know a lot of like 15, 16, 17 year olds that are on the pill for acne reasons. So mm -hmm. why does the pill help with acne? Because it's suppressing those hormones. Yeah, exactly. It suppresses our natural um, progesterone, estrogen, and because of that testosterone. And so it, it actually works pretty well for that. I mean, I think a lot of women feel like it's better. The um, caveat to that is when they come off of it, oftentimes mm -hmm. the acne comes back sometimes because the hormones just go back to whatever that root cause was to begin with. And sometimes because there's actually an overcorrection. So our testosterone has been suppressed for so long that when we take come off of the pill, the testosterone can kind of go crazy. And so people will feel like it's like it's worse after sometimes. Yeah. I've heard that quite a bit from people. They'll say like, it worked great while I was on the pill. And as soon as I got off, my acne went crazy. So yeah. something for people yeah. to know that are looking into the pill as an option for that. So let me ask you, are there other birth controls that don't affect your hormones so much? Like IUDs, do they affect your hormones as much as the pill does? Um, good question. So the hormone containing IUD, there's the Mirena, the Kylena, the Skyla, the Liletta, I think are the main ones that we come across. They're all progesterone based. They just differ in size and amount of hormone, amount of progesterone. Those ones are placed into the uterus. And so they secrete a tiny amount of progesterone every day. And most of that progesterone is just acting in the uterus. So it thins the lining of the uterus primarily. It can slow down the sperm and it can slow down the egg through the peristalsis, through the tube. But some people get suppression of their ovaries with it and some don't. And so for some people, what we used to tell people with the IUD is you're going to have all your same PMS symptoms. You're going to have all of your cyclic symptoms except the bleed because we're not turning off the ovaries. And for some women, that is true. They can still see when their cycle is, even if they're not bleeding, they can kind of tell for other women, they get nothing. They have no idea when their period is no PMS symptoms, no anything. And those women probably have more ovarian suppression. So when we talk about like local effect versus systemic effect, it's very different. I would say, statistically speaking, the um, local effects are the main source of birth control for an IUD. So if you were thinking like, I really want the reliability of the hormones. I really want the improvement of the bleed with the hormones, but I really don't want to deal with those systemic side effects. The IUD would be your best bet of those of hormonal contraceptives. Okay. That's good to know. So if it's releasing progesterone, are some women low in progesterone? So it actually can help them or not necessarily? No, because it's synthetic progesterone and most people don't feel much better with synthetic progesterone. Synthetic progesterone has some benefits in that it, you know, our natural body, our natural hormone cycles have these waves of up and down and taking a synthetic progesterone will keep it all level, which does help with some symptoms. But if you're talking about like supporting your low progesterone, you know, your, for whatever root cause your progesterone is low and you want to support that you'd be better off supporting it with a bioidentical progesterone if you're not looking at contraception. Yeah. Two different issues, but, but no, the synthetic progesterone doesn't typically support that in the same way. Okay. That's good to know. The copper mm -hmm. IUD doesn't have progesterone, correct? Correct. So the copper IUD is a plastic T with a little copper wire around the stem of it that prevents pregnancy by being toxic to the sperm. So the sperm do not like the copper. It also slows down the egg and it also um, probably prevents implantation if the egg and sperm do happen to meet. So no hormones at all. I've actually heard from a lot of people though, that they have terrible bleeds with that IUD. Is that a side effect? 
It can be. When they've looked at it um, in studies, they've found that about one out of 10 women will have heavier periods. Nine out of 10 women will not. And from my practice, I would say that's about right. I think anytime we talk about birth control, and that's going back to what I said earlier about talking to our friend or a neighbor, people usually talk about what's not working for them. You know, mm-hmm. people are mo- what much more likely to say like, never do that. Do not try the copper IUD. It's the worst. But what I see is, you know, I see people back for follow-up and I see plenty of people who are really happy with it. That's why I say, I I never want to scare people away from trying something because it could be a really great option for them. But the studies say nine out of 10 will have no change in their periods. They feel like they're not using birth control. They have their regular bleed. They don't have any side effects. One out of 10 will have increase in their periods. Of that one out of 10, I would say a lot of people will come to me and say, I notice it's heavier, but I don't mind. It's a couple tampons a cycle heavier. I don't mind. And other people come to me and say, what have you done to me? Get it out. So there are those people. It, it can happen for sure. So I hear a lot of people talk about the pill. I hear a lot of people talk about IUDs. I don't hear very many people talking about the patch or the shot. Are those less common than the IUD and pill or not necessarily? Yeah, I think they're less common. I'm um, especially for me in my practice, I think there's always some style per practitioner. Um, For me in my practice, I have maybe two patients on the patch because most women don't like it. It has a little bit of irregular absorption. So it can have um, some people complain of spotting. It looks like a bandaid or a sticker on your skin. So it leaves that little like dirty adhesive ring and you have to constantly be replacing it. And that's, I haven't had a lot of patients who have really liked it. So yeah. And with the um, shot, some people don't like the idea of coming once every three months to get a shot. And um, that depot shot for sure is associated with weight gain. So most of my patients that are on depot are teenagers who they don't want the discomfort of getting an IUD in and they don't want the next one on commitment, but they really want birth control for whatever reason. They will do well on depot, but almost all of them gain weight. Wow. That's good to know about the gaining weight. No wonder why it's not a trendy common one. Women don't need anything else to help them gain weight. Okay. So let's talk about cycle tracking. Do you ever recommend that as a good form of birth control or no way? Hey, I I recommend all things. I don't care (laughs) if it works for a woman. I say it works. I would say of the non-hormonal options, there's fertility awareness method or cycle tracking. And then I actually, one of the most commonly used non-hormonal contraceptive methods in my clinic is condoms. I have tons of people who use condoms and they're very happy with it. So that's not off the table. And then I want to mention before we move on, and then I'll come back to that is there's a newer birth control called Fexi, P-H-E-X-X-I, and that's non-hormonal. I've only prescribed it a couple of times because it's fairly new, but that's a vaginal gel um, that lowers the pH of the vagina. So the sperm can't swim. It oh, makes the sperm swim funny. So still, it's still very early. So I don't have a lot of anecdotal stories about that, but I think it's nice to have one more option and it's very, it's woman controlled. It's like a, the same consistency as a lubricant. So you put it in right before sex and you have sex and it's, it's not as effective as a pill, but it's another option. So I wanted to throw that one. Oh, out I'm glad you did. So it's only used before intercourse. Right. And you have to have it in within an hour. So if you have prolonged foreplay or you put in, you think you're going to have sex and then you don't for whatever reason, and then you do, then you want to put another dose in. So it's one dose per hour to cover that, that ejaculation. So that's an interesting option. Yeah, that is. Back to cycle tracking. What days should protection be used? Because you always hear about those people that were cycle tracking and got pregnant. And I think it's maybe because the days were off. Well, cycle tracking is very complex. Yes, I do recommend it. I think it's a great option for some people, but it has to be the right person. I think it's very empowering women to be able to track their cycles. Um, I think if they have very consistent cycles, 28 day cycles, 26 day cycles consistently, it can be very, very effective. But that day that you have to use backup birth control or abstinence depends on the cycle length. So if you have a 26 day cycle, then you want to start earlier than if you have a 28 day cycle. So it really depends on when it is, but typically ovulation occurs day 12 to day 14. And you want to start using backup birth control for six days before the day you ovulate. So you can see it's sort of, you really need to know your cycles and they really need to be quite consistent in perfect use. So when they've studied it and people have done it absolutely perfectly, it actually is very effective. It's probably in the upper nineties of preventing pregnancy. 
In typical use, where we say, if we look at everyone and say, how effective is this for most people? It's quite a bit lower, um, sometimes 91%, sometimes 85%, which means one out of 10 women will get pregnant, two out of 10 women will get pregnant. But the big thing that I often have to bring up with my patients is a lot of people want to use it postpartum is say, oh, I don't need birth control because we're, I'm just going to track cycles. And of course you can't track cycles until your cycles come back. So the fertility awareness method or cycle tracking is not effective if your cycles are absent <laughs> or if you have PCOS and have irregular cycles, or if you are not tracking your cycles. The other complication with the fertility awareness method that I see is it really has to be pretty involved with your partner. Your partner has to be on board or it can be tension causing, you know, it involves either using condoms or pull out if you're really willing to take a small risk or abstinence. And some of these fertility awareness methods will say abstinence for anywhere from eight to 13 days out of the cycle. And that's, that's, that's a, a long big, time. That's a big impact on your partner, especially when you know, five to seven of the other days of your cycle, you're bleeding. Right. So it really, it can be an involved process. I'm 100% in favor of people tracking their cycles and recognizing their cycles. And if that works for them, it's great. It can be really effective. Well, you saying that you ovulate like day 12 through 14, most people know that. I don't know if everybody knows that you need to subtract six days from that. So really you're on day six of your cycle, then you need to start using protection. Yeah. Depending if you have a shorter cycle. Yeah. So, yeah, I don't know if everybody understands that because you'll hear people say like, oh, I got pregnant on day six or seven of my cycle, but you just explained it that that's why. Well, and the reason why, I mean, you only ovulate one egg one day of the month, right? So we're pretty predictable, but sperm can live inside the uterus for five to six days. And so, and then usually with fertility awareness method, they bump it out a day on either side protection wise so that you don't get pregnant accidentally. So it's the same thing. Recognizing that though, in your cycle is how you get pregnant too. Like if you're trying to get pregnant, you track that and you say, okay, usually it's the first week of the month that you're not fertile. Usually the second week of your cycle, you are fertile and then bump out a couple more days in case you ovulate. And then you're fertile for one day after that. So I'm all about people understanding their cycles, using it as the primary form of contraception. You just have to make sure that that's in the cards for you. And that um, you're not that person who pregnancy would ruin their life. <laughs> right. If you're that person, you might want to consider a backup form. Right. Okay. Let me ask you one other question about the pill. I'm going to go back to the pill. Does the pill help people with PCOS or endometriosis or not at all? It depends what you mean by help, right? I mean, does it provide symptom relief? Absolutely. For a lot of people, it can. And for people who are not in the phase of their life where they're making massive lifestyle changes and really overhauling their life. I think I'm, it can be really helpful. I'm really grateful we have access to that medication. It can be really helpful for them. Endometriosis is incredibly complex, even from a root cause standpoint and a natural holistic standpoint, it's incredibly complex and can be really difficult to address because it's very inflammation-based. And as you know, inflammation is, can be a little bit of a beast to calm down. Um, especially in a long chronic process like endometriosis. So yeah, like birth control pills or um, synthetic hormones can give people a lot of symptom relief. PCOS, it's a little trickier. I mean, I think some people with PCOS, their primary concern is I didn't have a bleed. Well, I can give you a bleed. I can make you bleed once a month. Um, but is that really getting to the issue? I think more with PCOS, what we need to be talking about is um, glycemic control, is, is controlling blood sugars. A lot of doctors will throw out PCOS equals weight loss. And that's not completely true at all. It's more glycemic control than weight loss. Oftentimes weight loss or weight gain is a symptom. It's a symptom of your body's insulin levels and blood sugar levels going crazy. So birth control pills, they don't help insulin levels at all. They just make it look like you're bleeding. The one true benefit the birth control pills have in PCOS is that PCOS can be, can increase the risk for overgrowth of the uterine lining if you go for months and months and months without a bleed. And so the birth control pill will protect the lining from becoming overgrown or having a cancer. So that's the main safety thing with the birth control pill. And that's usually how I approach my patients with PCOS is to say, okay, we talk about safety, like preventing cancer. We talk about convenience. PCOS, often they have a massive bleed out of nowhere, no predictability. So we can fix that. It doesn't improve your fertility chances. It doesn't fix whatever is at the root of PCOS. So okay. yes, it can help, but it can help with, it can help with symptoms, just like in all the other 
cases. It's just not helping you heal from either of those. Correct. Okay. I just wanted to ask that because sometimes I have followers that say like, oh, I'm taking birth control for my endometriosis because it's helping me heal with it. And I'm like, well, yes. it's helping you with the symptoms, but not necessarily healing from it. So yes. I just wanted to ask you that. Okay. My last question for birth control before we move on as an OBGYN, is there a birth control that you prefer over others? I get asked this all the time. And I think the other question I get asked a lot is Dr. Craycroft, what would you do? What, or some mm. people just say, what do you use for birth control? And it's such a mixed bag. I'll give my personal experience. We've always struggled with infertility. And so I started the pill when I got married and uh, it did not do good things for me. It really, my mood went absolutely crazy. So I am a little biased with the pill because I myself have experienced that and seen how much it affected me. And then we've had infertility. So we've never used any other form of birth control. So for me, in my unique situation, I get to make that decision. Like I said earlier, if it's the 22 year old who is newly sexually active with more than one partner, going to college, not wanting to have a baby, they should not use the same approach that I'm using and just right. hope that they're infertile. Right. So I really, I really don't have a best birth control method. I really am happy. We have a huge variety because we have a huge variety of humans. And so it's, it's really great to give people options. I think for me personally, I do lean a little more towards the natural approach and interfering as little as possible with the body's natural mechanisms. So, so for me as a human, I would probably err on the side of an IUD, the copper IUD or the Mirena IUD, which is tiny amounts of the smallest amount of hormone we can use and still have those hormonal good effects. But if someone comes to me and says, I want a pill, I will for sure say, great, here's, here's what you need to know about it. And you let me know if there's a problem and we'll, we'll tweak it. So there's, there's, I'm, I'm grateful for lots of options. I love that you say that because there's just not one perfect one for every single person. It depends on your priorities, depends on your health, depends on where you're at on your health journey. So many factors play a role in it. So yes. thank you. I was just curious. I wanted to ask an OBGYN what they would say to that answer. So thank you. Yeah, of course. Okay, let's move topics. We've talked about preventing pregnancy, but now I actually want to move to pregnancy and talk to an OBGYN about the first trimester of pregnancies, because I know from having six kids, my first trimester was terrible with all six kids. I found things later on with child five and six that helped more, but I know a lot of young moms listen to this podcast. I know a lot of young moms struggle during that first trimester. Why is the first trimester so hard? Is it just are hormones changing so much during this time or what is it exactly? It's a great question and something I love talking about. It's not really well understood though. We think that a lot of it is because of hormonal changes. We know that there are massive hormonal changes that are going on. And those, the swings in the estrogen levels are intense. Um, and that beta HCG, that pregnancy hormone skyrockets in the first part of pregnancy and then will kind of plateau. And so a lot of people attribute that nausea and vomiting to that rapid change in hormones, whereas they kind of stabilize over time through the pregnancy. But I think there are still elements that we don't understand for some people, especially when you start getting to the extremes like hyperemesis, where people are vomiting to the point of weight loss and electrolyte imbalances. When we get to that degree, there often can be a psychological component. And I want to be careful saying that because that does not mean that it's in their head or that they caused it, but it can be probably a, a snowball effect, a domino effect of you start throwing up and feeling so nauseated and, and emotionally it's so challenging. It's so, so difficult. So there could be components of, of, you know, just mood or stress probably more so. And we've talked about that. And you've talked about that, the, the physical effects of stress and moods on our bodies, there could be a component there that weighs into it, but it's, it's pretty complex and we don't understand it very well. I wish we knew all the magic answers to the first trimester, because it is so oh, hard. Too. A lot of people just are vomiting the whole day. Um, my issue was just fatigue. I was yeah. so tired. I tell people that exhaustion is like no exhaustion I've ever felt before. So what is causing that exhaustion? That I love that you bring this up because this makes me like, I get a little bit philosophical talking about this. Number one, we think the fatigue is caused by your body working 
so dang hard to create a human. I mean, look at what it's doing at that point. People are always so surprised when we'll do ultrasounds pretty frequently in the first trimester, if they're having bleeding or, you know, whatever Mm -hmm. reason, and they will always be so blown away. Like we just looked a couple of weeks ago and it looks like this little peanut and now we're looking and it looks like a human. And so if you think about what's happening, like your body, you should be so proud of your body. And I think from a philosophical standpoint, you know, throughout time, the first trimester was a time that was really supported by women of the tribe. You know, it was a time that was, you were supposed to be kind of prized and taken care of. And I think in our culture, the idea of the first trimester is like, you get a badge of honor if you can like not let anyone know you're pregnant. You know, if you can do all the same things that you've ever done and more while first trimester, like that's kind of a messed up idea in our culture. I think to think that like, I'm exhausted. I shouldn't be exhausted. I should be able to go work out the same way I always have. And I should be able to go work and take care of my other kids the same way I always have. That may be where our issue is. You know, it may not be that we're trying to fix the fatigue. It may be that we need to coddle ourselves a little bit and, and give ourselves some grace and some love for doing this incredible human creation inside of our bodies. Like I just am still so fascinated by it and, and what our bodies are capable of. And instead we spend a lot of time, like my body is such a pain, like, look what it's doing. This is incredible, mind blowing stuff that our bodies are doing. Right. Well, and a lot of people do want to hide it till they're like 10 weeks, 12 weeks in case they miscarry or absolutely. They don't want employers to know yet. You know, there's all these different reasons. So we definitely have gone away from, oh, let's coddle and support and, you know, pride those women that are just newly pregnant because we do keep it a secret. Absolutely. And I think it's a, it's an interesting way to think about it. You know, I, I have kind of hidden my pregnancies the first bit because of miscarriages and complications. So I, for sure, I'm not saying people should behave a certain way, but in terms of just our mindset, it's an interesting thing to think about how we are like supposed to power through that phase instead of recognizing like you're fatigued because your body is working really, really hard. Go take a nap, Right. (laughs) go sleep, go rest. Right. Okay, so something I um, figured out with child five and six, which I wish I had known with child one through four, I feel like some of my fatigue was due to lack of vitamins and lack of minerals because I started going in and getting shots of B12s, different Bs, and I would really work on my minerals that I was drinking in like electrolyte drinks, and it helped tremendously. So Is that really true that maybe some of these women that are so fatigued, it could be that they're lacking some of these nutrients and minerals? Yeah, I I think it could be. I was going to say one of the things that I think makes the biggest difference for the first trimester, and we know this to some extent, are the three months leading up to pregnancy. You know, I think women who are very depleted leading up to pregnancy often feel worse. And that makes sense, right? Like Mm -hmm. that's a lot to ask of your body if you're coming into it from a state of depletion. But there are some interesting, very small studies looking at how, what does it take to increase our hormone levels, even in PMS, but, but in, in pregnancy, our hormone levels have to skyrocket. What does it take from our bodies to do that? Well, it takes nutrients and it takes minerals. I mean, that's how we make hormones. So if you are already depleted and then your body is taking what else you have left, absolutely. It's going to leave our stores pretty depleted. I don't know of any studies right now that have looked at um, electrolyte supplements or mineral supplementation in first trimester to see if it helps. I do recommend frequently electrolyte replacement like Redmond, their Relight, I think is a great supplement. And I think especially for first trimester headaches, I've had a lot of patients have a lot of success with it. I haven't had anyone report that their fatigue got way better, but, but I think it's still a young thing. And certainly it's a good thing. Like there's no harm. And if you're vomiting all the time, for sure, replace those electrolytes. And and I think you'll feel better. But yeah, I think that could be the source for sure. And like you mentioned, vitamin deficiencies too. Well, I was reading an article the other day that said most Americans or the average American, um, 75% of us are dehydrated on a daily basis. So that's going to include the pregnant women. So if we're dehydrated and then put pregnancy on top of that, when we need so many minerals and fluids and things to make this baby then that could really cause an issue, I think, with fatigue. I think so too. And and dehydration and the things that come with it, like 
uterine cramping or um, migraines or trouble sleeping or muscle cramps, like all of those in that first trimester are so, so hard. And so absolutely hydration, but especially electrolyte hydration, I think is huge. So, and I love that you said Redmond Relight because actually I've gotten a lot of DMs from people who say that the Redmond Relight has actually helped their morning sickness. So that's yeah. probably why. Yep, I think so. But talking about morning sickness, when people come to you as their doctor and they're just struggling with this morning sickness, what do you suggest to them? The things that we just talked about, I, I talk about the mindset and sort of like, well, maybe pull back a little, let your body rest. If you're you know, exhausted and feel like you can't take another step, listen to your body and give your body what it's asking for. I think protecting sleep and, you know, we talk about sleep hygiene in a lot of different ways. And when you're first trimester, I think absolutely protecting that sleep hygiene is really key. A lot of women feel so much worse when they're sleep deprived. So focusing on that can help with morning sickness. I do suggest electrolyte replacement sometimes. I think the prenatal vitamin can be helpful, but it can be really difficult to take. So I feel like once you're already pregnant, it's like, do whatever you can to get the healthy nutrients in. And then the um, sort of homeopathic remedies, I think can be helpful. Ginger is the one that's been studied the most and has been shown to have the best effect. So I think ginger in any form, but especially the dried ginger or candy ginger um, can be most helpful. I think peppermint is really helpful for people. So I'm looking for the Altoid that doesn't have as much sugar in it, but in the meantime, like Altoids, people who can kind of suck on Altoids through the day, that can be really helpful. The, a lot of people will recommend teas like peppermint tea or ginger tea. And I find a lot of women, it's so bland during that first trimester. It sometimes doesn't, doesn't settle well, but if you can handle it, I think the, the peppermint teas, chamomile tea, um, ginger teas can be really helpful. And then lemon can be helpful too. Hard candies can be helpful. Um, and they have the, the prego pops, preggy pops, I think mm-hmm. they're called those that have vitamin B6 in them. So they're like hard candies that have B6 in them. And then of course B, B6, and then we have the prescriptions, um, people do B6 and Unisom and that often works really well. That's nice because the compounding pharmacies will often compound it. So it's a little more accessible. They'll do it in a, in like a cream that you can put on your skin or a tablet. And then of course there's the prescriptions like uh, Zofran and Reglan and Phenergan that sometimes are where we get to and they help a lot. Okay. I'm so glad you just mentioned all of those things that can help in a first trimester. Um, But you mentioned one thing that I want to ask you about prenatals. So I have a lot of listeners that I feel like really stress out about which prenatal should I take, or I'm sick and I can't handle a prenatal. What should I do? So what's your advice on prenatals? It's a great question. And I don't know if I even have landed on the answer I'm completely comfortable with. One thing I do feel very strongly about is the most important time for the prenatal is the three months leading up to pregnancy. Mm -hmm. So our bodies don't rely necessarily on what we eat today, right? Those vitamin stores are what we've been building up. So the better shape you're in from a vitamin standpoint and nutrient standpoint, when you conceive, that's better. (laughs) And taking a prenatal vitamin after you find out you're pregnant, that's two weeks after you've started conceiving. That's two weeks after that embryo has started growing. So you're already a little bit behind the eight ball. So by far three months leading up is the time to focus on nutrients. When you start getting sick, hopefully if you've done that, then it gives you some wiggle room to say like, I just got to survive here. I'm going to do what I can. And then I'll start taking my prenatal after even the evidence looking at prenatals is pretty mixed though, that it's not stark that it helps, but I think it makes a lot of sense. Your body is using all of your nutrients and minerals to create a human. It makes sense to keep, keep supporting it. A lot of the benefit of prenatal vitamins is going to depend on what your diet looks like too, right? If you're eating a really dense nutrient dense diet with lots of different vegetables and grains, then you're probably not going to be as in need of those prenatal vitamins as you would be if you're not able to tolerate that, or if you are not eating any vegetables. So I think the short answer is do what you can. Plenty of humans have been created without Mm -hmm. people taking prenatal vitamins and have seemed to do okay, but where we can optimize the three months leading up to it. And then once you can, in terms of quality of prenatal vitamins, I think that one's really tricky. I think 
one of the things I've been learning about is shipping practices with a lot of supplements and some of them are not very well protected. So you end up with a crate of supplements sitting out in the sun for days on end. That, that makes sense that that may not be the best supplement for you. So I do think making sure that you're taking a higher quality supplement is ideal. If you can't afford the higher quality supplement, then, then do what you can. Right. And I always say, if you can't afford it, then try to focus on your diet, add in a lot more of the fruits, the vegetables, probiotics, kimchi at the store is really cheap, but it's a great probiotic, you know, get your vitamin D, you know, spinach is great for the folate, things like that. So you can absolutely grab those nutrients from the food that you need to buy anyways. So yeah. I'm glad that you said all of that because I feel like a lot of women just barely pregnant are so stressed out about that prenatal. So thank you for saying that. Yeah. So thank you so much for being here today. Are there any other tips that you would recommend to people that are trying to figure out which birth control to use or to those women that are just newly pregnant? Yeah, I think for birth control, I would say keep an open mind and don't go into it with fear. Know that it's reversible. It's, you know, you're not married to one option, try an option and then do what you need to do. And the things that I said at the beginning, figure out where your priorities are. If having a pregnancy would be a really bad thing for you, then you want to be more diligent about whatever method you choose. Even if it's condoms, that's fine, but just make sure that you and your partner are on the same page because an unintended pregnancy in some situations can be really life altering. Um, so recognize where your priorities are, do your research, know the options and don't go into it with fear, but with empowerment to say like, this is what's going to be best for me and my family situation. I think in first trimester, I'm really excited because I am creating an online course for first trimester that will come out here at some point. Oh, that's (laughs) I'm working on it. That's great. Yes, but one of the things I really want to focus on in that is the whole wellness package for the first trimester, um, because there is so much guilt. I did a little just straw poll recently with my viewers or with my Instagram followers about that first trimester and what they think um, they need to know the most about or what bothered them the most. And one of the things that kept coming up was fear, you know, fear of miscarriage, fear of becoming a parent, fear of changing their lives, fear of pregnancy complications. And I really want to dig into the mindfulness of that and sort of how to support your heart and your soul through all of this while supporting your body through the nutrients and through healthy eating and all of those processes. So um, hopefully you'll be hearing more about that soon. Um, But that's what I would say to someone newly in the first trimester, like just let it go, do what you can. Humans still usually come out fine on the other end and we optimize where we can optimize. And sometimes we can't optimize. So. I love that. And I love the mindfulness of it. Like, try not to be so afraid. Try to just be in amazement or yes, just amazed at all of this stuff that your body is doing, because it really is a miracle that is yeah. being performed in your body. You know, it's just, yeah, it's just a complete miracle. So enjoy those days is what I try to say, even though yes. you might be miserable. And it's not all or nothing. And I know it's easier said than done, but we have to counter the fear and the stress of it too. Yeah, we do. Because in any situation in life, we can just focus on the fear. There's so many things to be afraid of, but we've got to let that go and look at the good. Yeah, absolutely. Tell my listeners where they can find you. Yeah. So I am on Instagram at Mallory Craycroft MD and my website is upliftforher.com. And they can find on my website, you can sign up for the newsletter where I will post the um, updates of what's coming up. So for people interested in the courses that are coming or in my clinic, they can just sign up for the newsletter and they'll always get the newest information. And then there's also a waiting list there for the clinic. The waiting list doesn't commit people to anything, but it just makes sure I can reach out as soon as I open open scheduling. So you could always say, oh, never mind later, but that will, you'll be the first to hear about it when it's ready. And when is your clinic opening? I'm aiming for September. Oh, that's awesome. Um, I always end my show with asking everybody what the best ingredient in life is that they have found. And I know you answered this before. So now I'm wondering if you can give us a second ingredient. Yes, of course. I was thinking about this. I think I'm going to say mindfulness meditation. You know, it's so incredibly powerful. And I think that 
we can get a lot of fear around how to nourish our bodies. Like, oh, am I supposed to eat this? Am I not supposed to eat this? What if I do eat this? What if I'm exposed to this toxin? What if my air pollution is bad? And it sends us reeling in ways that we can't always control. But one thing we can always control is our mindfulness or at least we can learn to try our mindfulness and that meditation that, that has a physiologic effect. It changes our hormones. It changes our stress levels. It changes our sleep. And so it is like the ultimate empowerment for us to say, I don't always have control. You know, I go out to eat and I don't know what they're feeding me, or I couldn't exercise today because my kids woke up early. But one thing I can control is taking a deep breath, getting my brain in the right space where I am in awe and in love with life. And that is not just good for our brains, it's good for every part of us. I love that so much. In fact, I was just thinking, okay, I have recorded over 50 podcasts now, and that might be my winning best ingredient that I've heard. Oh, well, thank you. Because I really <laughs> love that we're in control of that. Like you yes. said, there's so many things out there. I can't worry about what I'm breathing when I'm outside and out to eat exactly what oil they've used on my food, things like that. But I can totally control my mindfulness or at yes. least learn to try to try. Yep. Absolutely. Oh, I love that. Thank you so much for sharing that. And thank you so much for being on the show today. I know the listeners have learned so much again from you and I really appreciate you taking the time to be here. Oh, so happy to be here. Thank you so much for letting me come. Thank you so much for listening. Remember to subscribe to the Just Ingredients podcast to learn more about your health and good ingredients to life. Plus, get daily tips at just.ingredients on Instagram.